Okay, uh, it seems like we're good to go. So the running time here is about 45 minutes with 15 minutes left at the end for questions. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit those in the chat box or in the questions box, and we will go ahead and address those after the webinar is completed. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Josh and, Josh and Tom. Thanks, Alex. Uh, this is Josh Kegley, uh, National Sales Director, and I'm located in Omaha. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, the idea for this webinar was uh, for our newer advisors or advisors that are looking for a refresher, the basics of 401k plan design. So what are the questions that you should be asking small business owners? Uh, what are the options regarding safe harbor, profit sharing? Um, and then running through a few uh, examples for you. Uh, I'll have Tom go ahead and kick things off and then I'll have some examples uh, later in the presentation. Go ahead, Tom. Thanks, Josh. Uh, my name is Tom Allen. I am the South Regional Director of Retirement Plan Consultants uh, based out of Houston, Texas. So just to kick things off, you guys, we're going to begin One second, you guys. Sorry, slight technical difficulty here. We're going to begin, guys, going over our agenda. So first, we're going to start, guys, questions to start the conversation. So most of us are used to having private wealth discussions uh, with our clients. And so to begin the retirement plan process, uh, it's going to be a very similar conversation that you're having, just slightly different questions. So we're going to be kind of going over some of the, the key questions you need to ask. We'll analyze the possibilities based on the answer to those questions, um, based on different scenarios that you guys are working with, different business owners, different business setups. Um, what are kind of the, the main drivers behind why we gear certain plan sponsors toward the typical solution? We'll, we'll take a very high level view about uh, non-discrimination testing and safe harbor, kind of the, the, the roadblocks we need to work around in order to come up with an effective solution how to communicate those options with clients. And then last but not least, how you can incorporate this into your personal financial planning conversations you're having with those clients. So how do we streamline this process to make it as easy as possible for you and the plan sponsor? So typically we want to start with asking questions and the, and the importance of asking questions is understanding what our clients needs are. We're not here to sell a product, we're here to provide a solution. So key questions that we want to ask basically fall into four categories. What is the overall goal of this retirement plan? Are we trying to maximize the benefit for the business owner? Maybe we're just focusing on key employees that they want to retain and attract. How much money is ownership looking to put away? That's going to kind of drive the solution in terms of do we go with a simple, do we go with a SEP, 401k, profit sharing, possibly adding a defined benefit plan like a cash balance plan. How many employees do you have? Any working part time? We want to understand the demographics of the business so that we can build an effective solution around it. And it's not a one size fits all type solution. There's a lot of flexibility there. So we want to make sure we understand the demographics of the business. And are you working with any other retirement plans? And you know, when I'm working with my advisors, it's basically a mindset of what is the client currently used to working with? And if we're moving to a more complex solution, possibly let's say from like a SEP to a 401k plan, how do we smooth that out for them so that we can just set those proper expectations for them? Analyzing the possibilities. So what are the main driving factors in our decision-making process? So most of uh, the advisors, you guys are used to kind of gathering client information, sending it off to Josh, me, Ricky, or Mike. And we're not trying to think about how do we put all these puzzle pieces in place? So what are the main driving factors behind when we report back to you guys, why did we come to that solution? So key things, goals of the owner. Again, going back to that savings goal, are they looking to save $5,500, $13,000, $19,000, $56,000 north of that? And you guys can probably understand those are the contribution limits for the different types of plans that are out there. So first kind of understanding how much money ownership's looking to put away. 
Or is it possibly just to focus on the employees? You know, are there key employees that we're trying to target? And I'll go through a few examples here um, later on, but that is sometimes the primary goal for the plan sponsor. They're looking to attain, attract um, talented individuals for their business. And so how can we design something around that? Again, going back to the demographics of the business, is it a small business? And in our world, a small business is any business with 100 employees or less. And once we start working with small businesses and possibly looking to maximize the benefit of the owner, you know, our mind tends to drift towards safe harbor, potentially. And it's not always the case, but that's typically going to be able to address the needs of the business, uh, given the demographics of the business. Do you have any part-time employees? Right. So sometimes we run into issues with eligibility requirements of, let's say, a SEP or a simple plan versus a traditional 401k profit sharing plan. How much flexibility do you want with that? Um, are there certain employees, if you have a large amount of part time employees, a SEP can get quite expensive. Um, and we have a lot more flexibility in a 401k profit sharing plan. So we want to understand those metrics as well. Understanding, you know, who are the owners, partners? How much do they want to contribute? And then what, are, what is their ideal situation for their employees? Um, and then also, you know, a company tax deduction is, is another reason that they're looking to implement a plan. The demographics uh, of this uh, construction company were one owner and 15 employees. And uh, one of the features that definitely came up was offering the flexibility of, of using Roth. Um, with the business owner, you know, they they had a they'd exceeded the income threshold for Roth. So in this instance, um, being able to offer that within the retirement plan was a huge benefit. Tom, on your end, um, are you able to to uh, view the screen or, or um, see what you're looking at now? I do see the scenario one solution up now. Hey, Josh, I'm, I'm still having trouble. My computer's frozen, but I'll just kind of keep clicking through here. You just keep guiding the conversation. I'll just keep clicking through okay. it, okay? Sounds good. Uh, scenario one, so the solution that we came up with for this plan was, you know, offering a 401k plan with profit sharing. So that allows contributions for the owner up to $56,000 per year. And to accomplish that, you know, we thought we needed to offer a, a safe harbor plan design, uh, given the demographics of the company. And by doing that, that would mean a safe harbor match to reward employees and increase overall tax deductions for the business. So um, we're going to get into that in more detail here in the coming slides. But, um, you know, that accomplished all the goals that they'd outset on the previous slide. Um, here's a second example in scenario two, what maybe a, a law firm would look like. So for them, the important goals were to attract and retain key talent maximize equity owner uh, contributions, and provide company tax deduction. Um, the demographics of this company consisted of three named partners, a share class, eight minority owners, and 20 other employees. Uh, the named partners, those three individuals were making over 500000 per year. Um, and again, during the discussions, you know, flexibility and, and being able to offer different benefits based upon class. And I've done several of these over the years. And uh, one particular law firm comes to mind where, you know, we can get really creative and, and each individual share owner could decide how much they want to contribute and if they want to have profit sharing. Um, so moving forward here with scenario two on the solution, what we came up with for this example was a 401k plan with new comparability profit sharing allocation. Um, and then introducing the idea of a cash balance plan on top of that. So those partners that were making half a million dollars or more, um, allowing them the option to contribute even higher than the $56,000 uh, 401k limit. Um, you know, that's something where you can reach out to your regional director and they can provide you additional illustrations for a separate plan, which would be a cash balance. And depending on the age of the owners, that's a way that they could put away uh, nearly $200,000 or more, depending on their ages. Um, with this specific um, plan, you know, we're going to, again, offer a safe harbor plan design that's a good fit for the demographics. Um, and in this instance, they were going to use a safe harbor non-elective contribution, 
that's always going to work best um, from a plan design standpoint where we know they want to contribute profit sharing every year and we know that they want to offer a cash balance plan to them to their key employees so now I'm going to kind of go over the basics of plan design um, the idea was just to kind of give you two sample uh, companies that maybe we see and the types of questions that we ask um, but now starting with uh, this next uh, group of slides I'm going to get into kind of the basics and what some of this terminology means. So to start out, um, the first group of employees that you're going to hear people refer to is the highly compensated employees. And a highly compensated employee is anyone making over $125,000 per year and is also greater than a 5% owner or through attribution is a family member of the owner. So that would be a spouse, children, parents, and grandparents. So that's going to be one of the two uh, groups within um, the discrimination testing. The other group is going to be non-highly compensated employees, uh, also referred to as NHCEs. So that is going to be anyone who is not a highly compensated employee. So that's going to be your rank and file employees that are making less than 125000 and are less than a 5% owner. So if they're a 2% owner making $120,000 a year, they are going to be considered a non highly compensated owner or highly non highly compensated employee uh when it, in regards to the a d p testing um you know these are all of the department of labor and i r s requirements that you do not discriminate in favor of the highly compensated employees within the four hundred one k plan So getting into some more of the specifics on how the actual non-discrimination tests work, um, there's several of them, and the first being coverage test. So a plan must cover a minimum number or percentage of non-highly compensated employees. So that's going to be the first test that's performed. Um, and, you know, there's a couple factors in that. Um, it's really going to depend on the demographics and the number of highly compensated employees, how many of the NHCEs have to be covered. Um, the second and probably the most common one that we get questions on or, or may run into issues with would be the actual deferral percentage test, uh, referred to as the ADP test. Um, so this is the one where it, it really takes into account how much the employees are putting into the plan compared to the highly compensated employees. So in this chart below, you'll see um, the first part, if the NHCE's average rate is, and we've got ranges here, so between 0 and 2%. Um, so, for example, if the average of the rank-and-file employees is 1.5%, we're going to multiply that by 2. So, the amount that the HCE's average can be is 3%. So, in the case of the first one with a construction company, one owner, if he had employees in you know, some of them aren't participating, some are, but the true average is one and a half percent. We'd multiply that by two, and he, that individual could only put in three percent. Um, you know, three percent, he may say, you know, that's not worth having a plan. Um, so let's move down to the next tier between two percent and eight percent. This is the one that you're going to see most commonly. Um, you know, for example, let's say that the NHC at, NHCE average is four percent we're gonna add 2%, and these are just all the rules and guidelines. So in this case, it would be 4% plus two for a total of 6%. Now, if that construction owner can put away 6%, depending on what his salary is, maybe his W-2 compensation is $200,000. Under that example, he'd be able to put away $12,000. Maybe that works for him, but again, you know, he could just be doing a simple plan or something else. You know, He's not getting up to the limit. Um, and then in the final tier, greater than 8%, you'd take that times 1.25%. If that's the case, you know, you're likely not running into any discrimination testing issues. You don't have to worry about the owner or HCE receiving a refund at the end of the year or having to make a QNAC or any sort of correction. Um, so typically when, when there is a plan that they're doing the discrimination testing, it's usually going to fall between that 2 and 8% most commonly. Um, and then kind of in conjunction with ADP test, so ADP, again, is just only the employee's deferrals that they're putting in. ACP test is actual contribution percentage test, 
And this is taking a look at all the employer contributions. So this would be things like match, profit sharing, and if the plan allows it, after-tax contributions. So that is kind of the, the basics of the, uh, the um, di discrimination testing. And so, you know, in those examples, if, if you're falling in those first two tiers and the employee averages are, say, below 8%, there's a good chance the, the highly compensated group can't put away as much as they'd like. So at that point, you've got a potential problem. Um, if the goal of the plan is to maximize the owner contributions, you know, they could be limited by how much the employees are contributing and how much they're receiving from the employer. So at that point, you know, we definitely want to offer some sort of solution. Sometimes that might be education or getting more participant involvement. Um, but the way that we're always going to try and design these plans is at least have a discussion with them about Safe Harbor and how that works. So first of all, you know, what is Safe Harbor? Safe Harbor is a mandatory employer contribution. So there's going to be rules that, that um, outline what the employer has to do. They're going to announce it. They're going to give a required notice to their employees, and, and they're going to have to follow the strict rules that apply to that. Um, why does it work so well for small businesses? So, you know, depending on the number of employees, maybe they're wanting to give their employees something, not just have them defer. So it accomplishes that goal uh, of either having a non-elective or a match. Um, but from a tax standpoint, you know, if in the couple examples we had where maybe it's 20 employees or less, by the time you give them um, a small contribution and the em owners or highly compensated employees are able to max out their contributions, and then you take into account the tax savings, it works out for a really great plan design for most small businesses. So along with the safe harbor, you have two specific options. Um, you don't use both, it's one or the other. And the first would be a 3% non-elective. So every eligible employee has to receive 3% of their eligible compensation. Um, the other option would be a 4% match. So every eligible employee that defers will receive a match up to 4%. Um, with the first option of the 3% non-elective, whether an employee puts in any money or not, they have to receive that contribution. Whereas the match, it is a true match in that sense where an employee has to contribute to get up to the 4% match. Uh, the most common formula is dollar for dollar up to 3% and 50% of the next two. So an employee putting in 5% or greater would receive a 4% safe harbor match from the employer. Um, now I'm just going to walk through a, a quick example of that. And, you know, if you've ever sent us a census and had us run a plan design, this is generally what that uh, looks like. Um, so this report going from left to right, uh, starting on the left side there, P is for principal. So we've got the owner, uh, the doctor, and a spouse are marked as the principals. O is for owner, and, and that'd be the doctor in this plan. H is for highly compensated employee. Uh, C is for class, so the doctor is, is coded as A, and that would be the only individual we're trying to maximize the contributions to. C for the spouse, um, they're also considered an HCE, but we, we aren't trying to maximize in the sense of profit sharing once we get to that point. Then we've got their name, uh, their earnings, their age, and now once you get over the deferral column, uh, we set this plan up last year, so in 2018, the maximum deferral was 18,500. Uh, moving over the next column, you'll see the, the match. This is the safe harbor match of up to 4% for the owners as well as all the employees. And then you've got $6,000 catch up. So for the top line there, the owner spouse, they get a total contribution of 25,540. For the doctor, 31,700. And for the company cost, you know, you've just got the 4% to all employees if they chose to defer. And we usually, for a starting point in these illustrations, we wanna show the maximum out-of-pocket cost for the company, and that's gonna be 5% uh, deferral for the employee. And then in turn, it's gonna be 4% safe harbor match from the company. So in this instance, you know we know that we're not gonna have any discrimination testing 
problems because we're using the safe harbor. And we know that between the husband and wife, they're going to be able to put in uh, roughly $57,000. If that meets the goal, that's great. We have, a, we have a good plan design here, no compliance concerns. Uh, as we move forward, we'll get into some of the uh, profit sharing options. So now we want to kind of step back and, and kind of discuss communicating with clients and um, you know how you can handle that as the advisor. Um, I think the first thing is addressing the client's needs. So again, trying to talk to them about what the goals are going to be, and you know, diagnosing before providing the prescription. And that's really where you can lean on the regional directors as well. Um, you know, we can help you with what those specific questions can be. Um, be involved in the meeting directly, and, and you know, certainly we don't expect you to be experts on that. That's where you can really lean on us and, and have us help guide this conversation. Um, so first of all, you know, what are my options in terms of savings goals? That kind of goes back to the original uh, discussion that Tom had, those different limits. Ide in an ideal plan, how much would they be able to contribute? Um, what are my options in terms of providing me flexibility? So again, this might be the owner maxing out deferrals, maybe um, including Roth for themselves or family members. Um, additional flexibility would be, you know, how are we going to design this plan? Is it, does the company have um, a lot of part-time employees that they'd rather keep out of the plan or they have a lot of turnover within their employee base? So maybe they want to require that the, to become eligible for the plan, an employee has to wait 12 months and has to work over a thousand hours to be eligible. So the goal there would be keeping employees out as long as possible, or in turn, maybe, um, the company is in a really competitive environment, and, and part of the reason they're offering a plan is they want employees to become eligible immediately, and they're using it as a recruiting tool. So just kind of talking through those flexibility options. And um, also, you know, what are my options in terms of overall net benefit to me? And that's really where if you can provide us a census and we can run one of these plan designs, rather than just type talking hypothetically about how much you could put in a plan, we can show them hard numbers of here's what you're going to be receiving or here's what the partner group or, um, you know, maybe their spouse or children can put in. So looking at it from a family perspective and then what's it going to cost for the rank and file and how can we best design a plan and, and give them hard numbers of this is what it would look like, um, at least as a starting point uh, of a maximum liability to the company and, and what the cost would be. So once we've kind of had those um, discussions, the next topic is going to be, what if we were to add in profit sharing? And, and this is where it can be, you know, a, a really powerful tool to differentiate it from the other plan types. Um, as we kind of get into this, what is profit sharing? Profit sharing is an additional employer contribution. So, you know, we've already talked about the deferral and safe harbor. Now, if we come back in the the owner says, I want to put away as much money as possible within this plan. How do I get up to the limit for this year? That's when we're going to introduce, you know, a separate bucket of money of profit sharing. Um, the great thing about that is it's going to be discretionary each year. So they're not required to do anything ever. And each year it's discretionary. So each year they can determine the amount. Um, in practice, you know, they're going to give us their census after the end of the year, 1231, we're going to probably come back and show them the maximum amount. And if that would say be a hundred thousand dollar contribution, you know, the owner could always come back and say, eh, I'm not comfortable making quite that big a contribution. Show me what it looked like for me and my employees. If I wrote a check for $25,000, um, vesting is allowed, um, for profit sharing. So obviously the, the money the employee puts in for themselves is always hundred percent vested one of the requirements for safe harbor is that employees are immediately 100% vested. But with profit sharing, you can have a vesting schedule, the most common being a six year graded schedule. And so you're gonna start at 0%, increase 20% per year. So after six years, an employee would be 100% vested. Um, what are the benefits of profit sharing? Um, You know, I think the, one of the main thing is increased tax deductions for the business. Um, 
with the new tax law and the 199A pass-through rules, this is something that we've had a lot of questions from from advisors, plan sponsors, as well as their CPAs of, you know, how can we at least be aware of all the options and incorporate that into the tax planning for the business and the individual? Um, profit sharing is, is again going to be the primary way to increase savings for the business owner. And finally, this is a great way to attract and retain key talent for the company. So next, I'm going to kind of go over um, the different types of profit sharing allocation formulas. So within the plan document, we're always going to write it in that the ability to make profit sharing is discretionary each year. And if we ever choose to make the profit sharing contribution, it has to fall under one of these following formula. The first and, and probably the original one would just be pro rata. So uh, it's going to be a uniform percentage to everyone. If the owner gives themselves 5%, they have to give all their employees 5% as well. Pretty easy to understand. Um, but in that sense, you're not benefiting the partners any more than the, than the rank and file employees. Uh, the second option is an integrated contribution. So this is integrated at a certain level of Social Security. This is a way to give um, those highly compensated employees that are being paid more than the rank and file a higher percentage benefit. Um, it's usually a smaller amount. So that type of plan design works well for younger business owners. Maybe if you've got a business owner that's in their 30s and their employees are about the same age or possibly even as an average older than the employees, integrated may be the method that we recommend. Um, the next option is age-weighted. And so this works well if there's a difference in ages, but maybe not necessarily wages. So the owners are making about the same as, as some of their employees, but they are significantly older. And in that option, age-weighted may be the best fit. And then finally, and this is definitely the most common one that, that we're going to be using is known as new comparability or cross-tested. The great thing about new comparability is it, it provides the most flexibility. So we're able to put every individual employee in the entire company in their own group. Um, so that might be maximizing, obviously, the, the contributions to the partners. But if they come back and say, you know, we have this really key employee, we have this salesperson or operations person or software person, whoever that really important employee is, they can key in on them and give them a higher percent than, than the other employees. Um, obviously at that point, it still has to pass all the discrimination testing, but at least they can, from the outset, give us those goals and tell us who they wanna give the larger contributions to. So ideally for new comparability, for it to work best, the, um, the owners need to be older than their employees and they also need to have significantly higher wages than their employees and you know lots of times that's the case if they're looking to w put away large dollars you know maybe those owners are in their 50s or 60s they're looking to put away a lot of money as they're nearing retirement and, and those are going to be your perfect targets to go after and offer this new comparability profit sharing option so um Furthering that previous slide where we just had Safe Harbor Match, you know, we've got all the same columns, we've got the same owner and spouse, the doctor, um, same wages, and we've already maxed out the deferral and the match. So this is strictly adding in the profit sharing column there. Um, the owner spouse, we've got at zero dollars. Um, that individual, the, their salary is only at twenty six thousand. If we want to get more complex, you know, we may run another scenario if, if they say that they have the ability to raise compensation, we could always look at that. Um, the doctor owner in, in column two, that profit sharing is $29,300. And really, we're backing into the amount. How do we get the doctor up to the maximum limit? And this was for 2018, $61,000. So we've accomplished that. Now, within the discrimination testing, how do we get, what's the minimum amount we have to give the employees? And in this case, it's 5%. So there are several tests that are part of the profit sharing, one of which would be a 5% gateway test. So we have to give the employees 5%. From a dollar standpoint, you know, this works out really well. The doctor's getting 29,300, giving the employees uh, the remainder up 
to the bottom, I see the total there is 45,800. So they're getting, you know, r roughly 15, 16,000 dollars. So the owner is getting a majority of this one-time profit sharing for this plan year. Um, this is a really great plan design, you know, much better than a pro rata. I doubt the doctor would want to give the employees, you know, 16.2 per 28 percent of their compensation if they didn't have to, um, but still provides a terrific benefit for the employees where they're getting 4% safe harbor match as well as 5% profit sharing for a total of 9%, assuming they're deferring out of their own paycheck 5% or greater. So, um, you know, once we've established that yes, the employer is interested in profit sharing, if we come to the conclusion that that's something they're likely going to want to do every year. Um, you know, we have this conversation with employers. Some have this stance where, you know, they'd prefer to do the safe harbor match. And the reason for that is, you know, they want their employees to have some skin in the game, can defer out of their own check, they're going to get the match. Um, others, you know, if their their stance is, you know, they, they're just doing this to benefit their employees and they're comfortable giving them the 3% safe harbor up front, this is going to be a more effective plan design. Again, we've got all the same plan demographics, maxing out deferrals, but in this case, we're using the 3% safe harbor, uh, not elective option. So whether an employee is deferring or not, they're getting that 3%, and by giving them 3% up front, that counts towards that 5% gateway test, and this actually lowers the profit sharing to the employees to 3.48. So you've got 3% safe harbor plus 3.48 for a total of 6.48 total employer contribution. Obviously, that's going to be lower than the previous slide of Safe Harbor Match, where it was a total of nine. So that's why I always say, if they know they want to do that profit sharing every year, the most cost-effective way for the employer is just going to be to go with that 3% Safe Harbor non-elective option. Um, kind of bringing this back full circle. So, you know, we went through a few plan design options. Um, you know, ways to bring this up or way for, ways for you to think of it while you're meeting with potential small business clients and when you're working through your personal financial planning with them is if you're meeting with those business owners quarterly, semi-annual, or doing an annual client review, what are maybe some of the things that you should be thinking about in, in terms of a retirement plan for them? Um, you know, updating the financial plan for them has the savings goal changed? Talking to them about, you know, are they on track for their goal? Uh, what are they doing for, for qualified plans? And uh, really having that discussion and then, you know, hopefully doing an illustration like some of the examples we've just walked through. Um, from a tax planning sense, you know, are you looking for additional tax deductions? Um, you know, that's a very common common topic, especially when we've had recent changes in the tax laws. Uh, have you spoken to your to your CPA about a qualified plan? Um, I think this is a great time of year to bring it up as they're probably walking through their 2018 information, analyzing where they're at and having plenty of time to plan ahead. You know, so so often I talk to business owners where, you know, they're they're probably intentionally keeping their W-2 income low. Um, you know, they, they've got some K-1 income and this allows them, if they start the conversation very early in the year, they can work with their CPA and kind of shift some things around because as you've seen from our illustrations, it can make a really big difference if they're paying themselves $100,000 W-2, 150, 200, all the way up to 280,000 for 2019. So the longer that they have to plan with their CPA, the better off they're going to be. Um, from a business planning standpoint, you know, are they interested in offering retirement plan benefits to their employees? Um, you know, just because you met with somebody two years ago and they were kind of in the early stages of their business, you know, that's something that's probably good to talk about every year. The situation may change as their cash flow changes or the competitiveness in the area or their business. Um, you know, maybe they're, they've been getting questions from employees and you know, that's something they feel like they need to start offering is a retirement benefit. And finally, succession planning. You know, are there certain key uh, employees that they need to keep around to run their business or, or um, you know, that they would never want to lose? And how do we have that discussion 
about how we offer benefits to those key people and, and maybe through upcoming business transitions as well. Um, as Alex mentioned at the start of the presentation, if you have any questions, please type those in. Um, hopefully this was a good uh, brief outline of, of the questions you should be asking business owners, uh, the basics of how um, discrimination testing works with ADP, ACP, and coverage testing. And then, you know, the starting point for us is always going to be offering a safe, one of the two safe harbor options, 3% non-elective or a safe harbor match. You know, once we've um, met that requirement, then we're always going to talk about profit sharing. Um, you know, we do offer several webinars throughout the year. And typically towards the fall, we, we have one um, regarding cash balance plans. If, if you have some business owners that are those higher earners that are nearing retirement, that that's a good fit, reach out to us and we can help with cash balance. That could, gets a little bit more complex, but really it, it, it builds upon those main fundamentals that we talked about. It, we always know if new comparability works well, then the cash balance should work well also. Um, and then finally, you know, how are you going to communicate this to them, to your business owners, um, incorporate it into your personal financial planning um, discussion that you're you're likely already having with clients. Um, so we'll go ahead and open it up now. Uh, feel free to to type in your question. Um, thank you all for taking the time to join us this morning. Yeah, Josh, we've got a couple questions here, and I'm going to try and back up in the presentation um, to actually show the slides that these go with. Um, so bear with me for just a minute here. Now we went all the way back to. the law firm example. Um, can you go into a little more detail about your um, particular law firm example, Josh, that you mentioned? I know you kind of touched on it, but we did have a question about um, how this is actually solved with the different class owners. Yeah, great question. And, and I, you know, reach out to me directly and I'd be happy to show you the illustration of this one. Um, the one separate from this one that's on the screen, uh, it's similar though, there was 10 partners and of various ages. You know, I think one was over age 70 and, and was, you know, starting to slow down and not work full time and just didn't have any interest in, in saving into the profit sharing. Um, we, there was a handful that were probably in their 40s or 50s and they felt like they really wanted to save extra dollars. Um, there was a couple of younger partners who who even said, "Hey, I'm I'm still paying off some school loans. I just don't have the ability. I I need the cash." And so what they did was they allowed every individual partner to decide if they wanted to put it in, kind of out of their own partner draw. So if you can imagine, let's say their partner draw for the year was fifty thousand dollars each, they could essentially just put that directly into the profit sharing and, and choose whether they wanted to do that or not. Um, so every individual partner had ownership of what their decision was going to be. And then as a, at a firm level, you know, they were comfortable. They had already been doing the safe harbor every year. So it was just kind of an agreement between the partners of, hey, we're going to offer this to all our employees. And it was about 2% of what they were going to give every participant rank and file in their plan. So, you know, there's kind of some give and take there, but it is a discussion that um, I've ultimately had with other law firms and other uh, medical groups since then, where it, it does provide a lot of flexibility when you look at it that way. Awesome, the next question is in regards to Safe Harbor. So I'm gonna try and skip ahead a little to that slide here. So when it comes down to the 3% non-elective or the 4% match, the question is whether a plan can switch between that match and non-elective each year. They can, yes. You, you, can, you can't switch during the plan year. What they'd have to do is start at the beginning of the next plan year. And, you know, they would typically want to amend their plan document. And to do so, you'd want to do so before December 1st. And that way you can give the participants a 30-day notice, letting them know, for example, you know, we've been doing a 3% non-elective, now we're going to switch to the match. And so you'd want to distribute the new safe harbor notice by December 1st, giving your employees 30-day notice. But 
it is, you know, to back up and answer the question, it's not something you could switch in March or June, just in the middle of the plan year. Um, it has to be done at the start of a new plan year. And Josh, just um, to kind of piggyback on that, do you see a lot of the clients switching each year back and forth? Typically not. You know, that that's where it's good to have this discussion and show them all the options up front and really find the one that's going to be the best fit for them. Um, occasionally we have clients that switch, but it's not likely that they're, you know, switching back and forth every year. Um, you know, kind of like that very last example I walked through, lots of times it's dictated upon, do they plan on making a profit sharing every year? If that's the case, you know, 3% non-elective is going to be the better option. If they're aware of the profit sharing and don't think they'll likely use it, then maybe the 4% match is the better option so that, you know, they're getting their employees involved and they're, they're making sure that they're deferring to receive the safe harbor match from the company. Gotcha. So, yes, um, to kind of go back to the question, you can switch. You do have to plan a little bit ahead if you are going to switch between the non-elective and the match. Um, and, again, it is just something that you don't see people switching every year, but it is something that a client can change. Correct. Yep. And, and so, you know, that's something where you'd want to reach out to your TPA and have that conversation uh, at least in the fall if you're planning to change January 1st. And so we just have one last question. Um, I did want to let everybody know we will send out um, the slides and the recording to everybody that attended here. So that will go out automatically as soon as we have that recording available. Um, the last question here, Josh, does have to do with the catch-up column. We had a few people comment, you know, why is the catch-up actually not included in the deferral and therefore matched upon? Can you go into that a little bit? Yes. Uh, so that that's something that we kind of separate out in in it for a few reasons. Um, first of all, if if the plan had discrimination testing and, and there wasn't match. Um, the the HCE putting in that catch up dollars, they would never receive the refund. So let's say um, they were only allowed under the discrimination testing to say put in three percent. Well, they could put in that three percent plus six thousand dollars. So it's almost like it's it's in its own column or separate category, just like this. And then also um, you'll see that the employee is getting a match on the dollars that they've put in. Um, Alex, from your standpoint, do you want to clarify that question at all or answer it? Um, no, I mean, I, I think you, you clarified it pretty well there. If you look at the deferral column, um, you know, the deferral is at 71% and 10% for the doctor and the spouse. So the match is already maxed out, which is kind of why you don't see an additional catch-up match column. Um, but also to go with that, the reason we do put somewhat generic titles on those columns as deferral and catch-up is that it can be either pre-tax or Roth. So you can put the deferral in as pre-tax or Roth. You can also put the catch-up in as pre-tax or Roth. Good. I think that takes care of all the outstanding questions. Um, so Josh, if you wanna go ahead and close it down, we will be good to go. All right, thanks Alex. And thank you for everyone uh, for taking some time out of your morning today to uh, go over this plan design. Uh, we appreciate it and, and we appreciate your partnership. If you have any questions or you have any prospects where you'd like to walk through some of these plan designs, show your clients safe harbor, profit sharing, uh, please reach out to your regional director and, and we'll help you with that. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, and have a terrific day.